What's up, y'all? Back with another section of sneaker law. I'm trying to make sure I get this in the right angle so you can see it. Back with another section of sneaker law, and I'm treating this as if it's one of my classrooms to give you professors out there who are going to be utilizing sneaker law in your classrooms the ability to mimic my fantastic teaching skills. So, we are on chapter four. And this is the, and I'm doing a terrible job, and my finger is giving you the bird, manufacturing and distribution. So we're on the manufacturing and distribution section. And this, I said chapter three was the most important section the last time. Um, chapter four, equally as important. And I didn't think I was going to say that. I was like, manufacturing and distribution, uh, you know what? There's a lot that we can get into here, and I'm not even going to go there. Uh, I had to leave it off of the page. I was on the last page for this lecture. So just go with me. Um, take the time to visit the Sneaker Law website. It's in the description. And um, what I want you guys to do is if you want to buy it, then maybe I'll start doing these as lives. And we can go through it at the same time and you can ask questions. Now, it will be better if Jared and Kenneth were answering the questions because it's their book. But um, if we're treating this like a class or a course, why not? All right, enough talking. That was the introduction. It was a long introduction. I apologize, kind of, not really. Section four, uh, manufacturing and distribution. So we get into this thing and we start going through it. And I'm going to hold this like over here. And that way you can still see a little bit. And it starts off with a couple of quotes that are pretty uh, good. And then it dives directly into sneaker components and materials, which when we start looking at the manufacturing aspect of everything, this is important. In this lecture, we're going to go through, you're going to get some really good, so stick with me, um, content to look at and compare with the discussion that they create in the book. I'm going to use my own sneaker company as evidence, all right? And I'm going to my notes, of course, because going to the notes is going to help us to go through the chapters quickly. But uh, the next page where they talk about the sole and the upper, they forget one vital part of the shoe in this discussion. And here's my note on that. They have a breakdown of the shoe right here to using the Air Force One. And they didn't write anything about the strobo. So I said the strobo is now being utilized by brands to decrease break-in time and improve cushioning. So that's a missed part of the shoe. And then they also missed the aglet, which is just the shoestring tips. And those are important because those are now being used for branding opportunities and they're using different materials on the shoestring tips. So it's a pretty cool thing. And you actually have guys that have created entire businesses out of lace swaps. All right. All right. So um, also here, they didn't talk about counters. Um, Community made no other production manager over there. He was like, Chris, the shoe actually has um, a toe box counter. I always thought counters were heel counters and I didn't think about a toe box counter even in the process of me creating a shoe I never thought about the toe box counter um, but the counters provide stability and um, they also provide shape it's a pretty important thing but it's not mentioned in here here it's called the back so that's just me looking at an aspect of the book and the reason I have the picture over here to the side is because the Nike KD 12 featured a strobo stitch, right? But that strobo stitch was not for a typical strobo. It was a full length Nike Zoom airbag. And that's why I was saying the strobo is now being utilized in different ways. It used to be just a piece of like cardboard in a sense, man, just to keep the shape of the shoe as it sat on the last before you attached whatever, whatever midsole that was going on. But Nike has basically moved the strobo into being a performance piece. Pretty impressive stuff. All right, so let's keep going to my next note. My next note is in regard to the sneaker manufacturing process where they talk about the locations where shoes are made and the fact that you have to have prototypes done, right? So we're gonna dive and we're about to do a deep dive into this in one second. But when they talk here, they overlook two really important factors and they get into a 3D printing and prototypes but they forget to talk about the Nike Express Lane, uh, the Adidas Speed Factory, and how those are helping brands to move the delivery of product faster and get to the consumer much quicker. Um, 3D samples help, but traditional cobbling is actually making a comeback. And I mentioned community made. Traditional cobbling is making a comeback. So I'm moving this over 
because there is an article I'm going to put in the description for Speed Factory so you guys can go and read that article on Speed Factory by Adidas and Express Lane by Nike and both of these this was written in 2016 this one was written in 2017 so pretty important stuff there in regard to manufacturing and uh, the process of manufacturing so let's keep going here we went to Express Lane and we are now moving into the production X, uh, aspect they get into quantity and size runs variations in size and my note on this page is about the fact that brands are failing to create last for women men and women do not have the same type of feet um, you have to go and talk to an orthotic a pedorthus or whoever those guys are that make these insoles and things like you know what chapetta shoes chapetta shoes is a fantastic resource for this section chapetta shoes i'll put the link in the description okay so let's keep going here and uh the manufacturing aspect so other manufacturing concerns now when they got to this part this hit home very hard so let's see why it hit home they talked about boxes and manufacturing of the boxes and making them look cool or whether you're not going to uh, when I made my shoes, I did not spend a lot on my boxes and branding. I tried to pass on savings to my consumer because I was new and I couldn't have an expensive shoe. Now, that may have been a mistake, right? But in the process of creating a shoe, there's a lot that goes into it. And this talks about navigating factories, best countries, third-party production, and very valuable information. And here is why. So let's jump over here. When you begin to create a shoe, and this is what this section is about, the design, this shoe is my uh, second running shoe, the CG0972, and I'm talking right here, so I'm going to be moving my mouse and moving the picture up and down. In the summer of 2012, Ian Gale, my, uh, my dude, he was my designer at the time, and he made, and I paid him $2.50 per shoe, a royalty. I paid him $2.50 per shoe, so if I made 100 shoes, he got a $250 check, basically. So he designed these shoes. So once I had the designs, the designs done, then I sent them to my manufacturer. And a manufacturer began to put these in process. So here you see the last, which is a part of the book. My shoe is on the last here, and it's getting produced. There's no outsole, midsole on the shoe right now. And here are pictures of the shoes in process. And I'm going to show you another picture here of the shoe sitting on the last. And the outsoles are already attached, right? And this doesn't allow us to go, you know, look at it a lot. Now, this is the process of when it's finished. They threw them in the bags with the numbers on them. This shoe, the entire production run was flawed. I had to, I had to donate this pink and gray shoe to a women's charity because they left the markings on the pink. I couldn't sell them because you could see the lines for the manufacturing and that's where he's talking about the manufacturers and the importance of getting a good manufacturer that's critical so this is the spring and that shoe is being produced right so people are calling let's take a break okay so we're back after the phone call I had to take care of that and we were talking distribution and I was talking about the manufacturing issues um, I have a QC person that could check things over in China they did not do a very good job. And as I said, the entire run of this pink shoe had to be given away, basically. It was just a complete wash. I lost money on those. And um, in a 100-pair run, because I was doing 100-pair runs of each color, in a 100-pair run, there was always a 10% damage rate. Always a 10% damage rate. Um, so when we moved into the production of these shoes, we see the pictures again and they're all stacked up. This is before they go on to the last. It's all been sewn together, all of the pieces. And remember, this all starts from the sketch. All comes from the sketch, right? Um, when in the book, they discuss the process of creating cool boxes. I'm going to show you guys how I did my boxes because it's um, you have to make a decision what you're going to do because you can build these fantastic boxes but when you're just starting out everything you do adds cost a shoe box that's designed like this is going to add 30 to 40 dollars per pair even if even if it's produced in a big amount all of the printing that goes on 
a lot of the things that you pay for in a shoe it really is the excess or the accessories to that shoe that cost a lot of money the shoe production itself for me to make my shoes it costs thirty dollars a pair so that's how much it costs to make my shoes um, I also made t-shirts that went with the shoes so when you bought a pair of shoes you got a t-shirt in the box but this is how my shoes came from Uline in a big bundle like this and then I had to go through and um, I had to go through and make my boxes so you see this is the shoe box before completion I bought a stamp from Vistaprint and I would have to center and line up and center my um, my stamp before I stamped my logo on top of the box and for some of you guys it's probably like oh man that's that's whack I bought my stickers with Vistaprint and I put my stickers on my box myself I did everything from beginning to end I didn't have I had one employee at the time but um, she had finally gotten a job and moved on and I had to do all of this myself when the shoes came I had to take them I had to stuff them with the paper to keep the shape to bring the shape back because they were compressed and this leads me to another discussion of that they left out in the book and that's back here where they talk about distribution once you make your shoes if you have your shoes and you made your shoes in China you're going to have import and freight and duties on those shoes and there's certain taxes that you have to pay so in this section where they talk about the shoe coming from the manufacturer they don't get into duties um, and in particular if you want to learn a lot more about duties and all of these different things associated with the shoes I'm going to recommend to you guys to go to FDRA because FDRA has people that are um, lobbyists in some instances going in writing letters fighting for the removal of different tariffs on shoes so depending on what the materials are on your shoes you get taxed accordingly and that's pretty important stuff man and it should not have been missed out in this section and that's for the guys so when they start working on volume two they can come back to this note and remember to put that information in there but FDRA does a fantastic job of explaining this information now we're going to go to my final and they have a dope section in here on sneakers that's really cool right and uh, they talk about direct to consumer and the different channels and sales funnels and e-commerce and then they show you the got them and when you lose out on Saturday as in Satter, S-A-D-D-E-R, Saturday. And then they talk about some of the major retailers. It's a very good book, very good book. Now, my last note on this section in here was a difficult discussion that can be addressed here is type of accounts and wholesale retail relationships. So when people talk about retail and sales and e-commerce, always overlooked in that uh, discussion, always, is... The fact that, and that's why when people say stuff like, oh, Foot Locker's in trouble, or, oh, Nike's in trouble, we make these kind of blanket statements, but we're making them, those of us who are saying it are saying it to bring attention to something, but we know for a fact that companies are not in trouble because of one thing in particular, um, urban accounts. Urban accounts are moats, and that's because a lot of people who are in um, cities or that are not in the digital economy they are not going to be in the digital digital economy economy for a while and they don't have anywhere for you to ship their shoes to so you got a lot of people that are still going to go to stores in retail and that's another discussion but i'm going to finish up this video uh, and that's the end of the chapter y'all and we're moving on to chapter five which is which is licensing and collaborations but what i want to do is and i'm going to keep this book just sitting right here um, I want to go back and show you guys about the process of making shoes. All of this was back in 2013. In uh, 2018, I was like, I took a whole bunch of time off. I made a shoe in 2015, and then I lost a bunch of money in 2016, 2017. And I was like, I'm done. I'm not making shoes anymore. And then me and my daughter sat down, and we sketched this shoe. So we worked from a sketch, and then we scan it in, and then we clean it up with whatever software we're going to clean it up with. But this is the shoe that I designed. This is the shoe that my manufacturer made after I paid for the damn sample. This was garbage. I quit taking my talents to South Beach and I opened myself up for employment because I was like, you know what? I'm done, man. I'm not making shoes ever again because I get this garbage.
that's not what I wanted. There was so much wrong with it. I literally quit because I lose so much money making these shoes and making the samples. It's extremely frustrating. Do not. And this is how I was acting with the manufacturer. I was like, yo, 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 this is what I want my money. Yo, I want my money. Oh, uh, you know what? Just I want my money. You know what I'm saying? You. This is oh, me. Oh, you know? That's funny. I this could is have me. sworn I said have it today. Yeah. I, I wanted my money. You know what I'm saying? That's what I, I wanted my dough back. Now, I came back in 2019 and I was going to make this shoe, which is a variation of the original design. So you go back here. I took this out and I turned it into a sock. And I was going to make these shoes and I just changed my mind and I said, I'm not making any more shoes anymore. I'm done. And I started giving my contacts to my manufacturers to other people. Now, you can do that if you want, but that's the end of that. That's um, Sneaker Law. That's Chapter 4. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Um, use the links down here to go look at all of the information that I shared in the video. Um, like, share, and subscribe. If you like this information, I still have. That's where I am right now. You see my shoestring. That's where I am. I still got a lot of book to cover here. Shout out Kenneth and Jared. Phone's ringing. I got to run. I'll see you guys on the next one.